Do you think I was too hard on this product? Some people do. Uh, you know, every now and then if I'm harsh on a product, um, the brands take exception to that. Now in this instance here, Corsair was not like, Jay, why did you say all these terrible things about our water block? It was actually a reasonable, Jay, why didn't you at least test our water block? Um, well, that's the difference between unboxings and first looks versus actual product testing. And that was an unboxing and I didn't need to turn, like put it on a card to stand by my opinion that it's ugly AF. Um, but anyway, in the interest of fairness, I want to go ahead and do a little bit more in-depth dive on this water block. Now, this is the um, XG3 RGB, part of the Corsair Link lineup of HydroX products. This is specifically for the 4070 slash 4070 Ti. They also have a 4080, 4090 version as well. Um, we're not going to be testing that one today. We are going to be testing the 4070 Ti because that's the one that we have. Okay, but let's just get past aesthetics. Let's, there are plenty of people out there that are like, well, function over form. Well, that's what we're going to test today is the function because I've already come to my conclusions about the form. I, I have eyeballs and I can use them to determine the form and the subjective manner, which I do not like it. Um, but what I want to also point out is the fact that uh, they, and I did say this in the video, it has, this is a fan. We thought it was a flow meter initially when we saw the pictures of it. But this is a fan which does suck air in and blow air out of this chamber and this chamber directly on the power delivery system to give you as much cooling as possible for those components. Now my biggest concern about that, so if you look over here, this is an ASUS 4070 Ti, what is it, Tough Gaming? It is not a card I want to use by choice right now. It's the only 4070 Ti that we have. So I wanted to use uh, the 4070 Ti instead of the 4070 because it does generate a little bit more heat, which is going to test the block more. But I don't know, maybe Phil can get some insert shots here. We have two heat plates that are here and here, which attach to the main heat sink. These are touching the VRMs, which means that the VRM temp, uh, heat is being at least somewhat absorbed into the main cooler and dissipated. The back plate, we'll find out when I take it apart, does appear like it might have thermal pads on there. Then we'll be losing all of that functionality because as you can see, this has no back plate. So you'll be not, you won't be able to reinstall the back plate. You also won't be able to, um, you'll be giving up this three fan setup for a water cooled card, obviously. Now we need some data to compare it to. And if we look at our screen right here, I've had Port Royal looping for a long time prior to even starting this video. I'll stop it in a sec so you guys can see the overall numbers. But if we look right here, you'll see my GPU is currently sitting at 58. It hit 59 for a moment there. There it is. It'll drop down to 57, 59, and it fluctuates a couple of degrees based on the load of Port Royal. And as the test goes on, it tests different things. This is a ray tracing test, which means all those tensor cores are also doing their thing. It's not a DLSS test, so I don't believe the, the uh, I said tensor cores, the RT cores are doing their thing. I don't believe the tensor cores are necessarily doing anything right now. But it has been locked at 2850 megahertz the entire time. It is 100% GPU utilized. It is also power vol our voltage and power for a second. The voltage is our limiting factor. Um, 58 to 57 degrees. I want to point out, I also did go into MSI Afterburner and en enable the user defined fan curve, which is just that predefined fan curve. That way it doesn't go into zero RPM mode. And it's a little bit more aggressive with the fan. Uh, so anyway, that's why we're getting such good temperatures, not to mention it's also in an open air test bench, which means no, no case or chassis is affecting our temperatures, just the cooler of the card. And that's what you need when you're testing card cooling is having the card cooler be the only variable in the equation there. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the test here. It's been running for about 15 minutes. Look at our, our clock never wavered once. So already that's one of the benefits that you get for water cooling a graphics card is the fact that the clock won't fluctuate. But if the cooler is good enough, and this is a fairly low watt part versus their 4080 and 4090 you know, counterparts, we already got locked frequency. So we're not gonna gain that by water cooling it. If we take a look at our um, power limit here, our power draw, we're drawing in the 250, 265 range. Fluctuates a little bit based on the test. You can see it dips in between the test. Every Every low dip you see right there, that's when it's reloading the test. So it looped one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times already. Um, if we take a look here at our temperatures, oh, those are CPU temps, we don't care about any of that stuff. But anyway, our, our GPU temp, you can see after all that time was in the 55 range and then it was doing 57, 58, 59, 57, 58, 59. So 
pretty solid right there um, in terms of its performance. So now what we need to see, oh, I also need to look at the hotspots because I did have hardware monitor going at the same time because I'm curious about those hotspots. So you can see our max GPU temp, it looks like it hit 60C for maybe a split second there. And the hotspot was 70.3. Typically your hotspot delta is between your edge temp and your, or your global temp and your hotspot are about 10C on NVIDIA cards. So that's holding norm uh, true right there. Our memory temperatures, as you can see, maxed out at 64. So that's one temperature we wanna keep an eye on because it is touching the memory as well. What I don't have visibility on, and it really sort of bothers me, I need to check GPU-Z right now to see if it has it, is VRM temperatures. So even with the latest version of uh, GPU-Z, I do not have voltage regulator uh, temperatures. I just have to keep an eye on all the other visibil visibility stuff. My main concern actually was whether or not just blowing air directly at the component with no heat sink on it will suffice. I mean, I guess technically I think it will because that's exactly what we did with our XOC stuff was just blow a fan at the exposed VRMs. However, a heat sink touching it would certainly be ideal. All right, I need to power this off. We need to tear this down and I wanna see the internal design before I get this thing full of fluid. These are the heat pads for the uh, thermal pads for the RAM. Take those off. Those just look like regular little teeny tiny torques. Like that's the official size is teeny tiny. So I can tell by the type of screw they're using that it's screwing directly into plastic, which means I, I would not take this apart too many times or you're gonna start, stop getting your proper hold tension and maybe a leak. So there should be no reason for you to ever take this apart. I'm only doing it because I'm really curious as to what the internal flow design looks like, as well as I mentioned in my previous video that that cold plate was just what seemed to be far too thin. Maybe for a 4070 it's not. So that's it. So it's a very basic design, right? So this is basically the only metal in this thing. And it's all, it's all the copper, as you can see. The hit, uh, heat fins are extremely thin. I don't even have a gauge able to measure that size, but you can also see down in the middle right here, we've got this you know, flow doohickey. So obviously this is the inlet. It comes down through here. Easy to assemble and clean, or disassemble and clean if you needed to for some reason. Just keep track of where everything went. But that's it, that's the basic design. The O-ring is built into this injection molded plastic right there. And that is the entire design. Okay, so teardown should be pretty straightforward on this guy. I expect the actual installation of the block to be pretty easy because there's only four screws. <laughs> okay, so the shroud is off, which you have to actually take off separately. There goes the warranty. <laughs> it's a weirdy bitty, look how tiny it is. Oh my goodness, it's so cute. Yeah, so this is why the back plate wouldn't come off initially because there is a couple screws right here going down to the back plate that way. Now one can argue the effectiveness of these thermal pads on the back. However, they are there. And they are touching these components on the backside. So again, <clears throat> you may argue that it's unnecessary. Okay, so this is gonna be pretty simple here. Let me get the screws out first. Oh, and by the way, there is also this adapter, which I missed that was in the package in my previous video. It's actually the biscuit connector to JST plug, which is the three pin like Corsair plug. Or you'll also find it with a few other brands. And then you can actually convert that plug to the regular three pin like motherboard header. And then you can control the colors of the block with the uh, motherboard or any other software like Signal RGB or something like that. One could technically argue that I can leave this on. It would look pretty dumb. I don't know, I don't know Phil, what would you do? If you were installing this for yourself, would you leave the back plate on knowing now no. that there's heat sinks? <laughs> no. Okay, all right, well, Phil has spoken. <laughs> I'm gonna mount these first. Okay, so they bought them out, so you can't over tighten. I mean, I guess I've seen worse. <laughs> if we look at the little vent though, it does blow down right on the VRMs. The air vent is blowing down right on the VRMs. I guess technically we could have put heat sinks along there if we wanted the little mini ones. I don't like that that is lower than the height of the PCB right there. Although this is part of the problem of it trying to be a quote unquote universal product. If you're trying to make it so that it'll fit on any 37 or 4070 slash 4070 Ti 
die, then you've got to account for that height. Because I'm going to be, because this is going to be going vertical mount over here like this, then I was planning on using 90 degree adapters to have the tubes come off where I need them to. I know I'm really repeating myself, it just looks dumb. I've seen worse, I really have. It's just full cover water blocks, so that's just, that's just my jam. So according to the manual, these are actually for affixing the IO bracket. I guess some cards need them like screwed together, like if there's a brace. I know some of the MSI cards have a brace that comes up. You might have to screw it down to that, I'm not sure. Anyway, this is now considered installed. So let me get it on here. Let me get my, here's my little temporary loop which is just a Brico rad. It's a 240 rad, which is plenty for a 4070 Ti. Um, and then this is just the, I figure if I'm gonna test the IQ product, I might as well try the IQ ecosystem. <laughs> you gotta be careful when you're tightening it too, because you don't wanna put too much pressure on this plastic and potentially break it. Uh, something else I wanna point out too, these are EK fittings, but they are um, thick because I'm using soft tubing for this, thick wall soft tubing. I don't know if, maybe with Corsair's high, like the hard tubing, You'd be able to use that head that you can't use that plug. Like even 90 degree plugs will not fit in there. You can't. So unless you were using like a smaller diameter, like um, hard tube, soft tubing is probably a no go on the fitting side, which means we just lost the pass through ability of those fans. So I want to point out this is also a Corsair radiator. So I feel like maybe if those were a little bit narrower, but this is kind of like standard gapping right here. NZXT's build is a quick and easy way to get a new gaming computer. Build a gaming PC on your budget using the built-in configurator and see exactly how your favorite games will perform. Don't want to spec it yourself? Then choose from BLD's pre-configured player PC systems designed to fit your needs and budget. To see the full lineup and specs of the NZXT BLD Player Series pre-built PCs, follow the sponsored link in the description below. Okay, so my loop is set up here. Got the proper order. Inlet is on the left, outlet is on the right. That is out to the rad. From the rad to the top of the reservoir, down through the reservoir, into the pump, out of the pump, into the inlet. I had to go from the main module to a four splitter because again, there's no pass through in any of the Hydrex stuff, which was another gripe of mine. And they were like, why would you want that? This is why I would want that. Anyway, moving on. All right, so everything's plugged in and working. Fans are going, cooling speeds are set to extreme right now. So they'll ramp up pretty nicely. Um, so the fan on here is also controllable, just like any other fan. So by default, it's, it's gonna show up on here as the XG3 hybrid. So I just wanna point that out. You can control the fan curve of that fan. I'm just gonna leave it on extreme for now. That's what I tend to do when it comes to, um, and the pump is not being controlled right now. The pump's actually set to the highest setting still on the physical switch on the pump. Anyway, I tend to leave the fan curves a little bit higher and stuff on my water-cooled gear. I'm not one of those people that water cool for acoustics. I do it specifically for the performance. Our idle temp, I want to point out on air, was 25C with the fans uh, on on the GPU with that fan curve. So this is the fan curve right here. It's just the default one. When you enable it, this is what you get. I didn't touch any of those points. So it was at 25C idle where you can see right now, it just went from 23 to 24. It would probably take a little bit of time for this loop to completely equalize um, at idle because there's such a little wattage being put in there, but it's back down to 23 as you can see. So let's start at Port Royal. Let's let it go for a while because we want to make sure the water has plenty of time to equalize. Air coolers hit their max temps much faster than water coolers because the thermal capacity of water is so much greater than air. It takes a while for that water to reach its final uh, max temperature or equilibrium. What we mean by equilibrium is the max temperature that the water is going to get based on the ambient air temperature used to cool it through the heat exchanger. It just takes longer when it's water. Okay, let's see what the init initial temperature spikes go to. All right, 40 C. Oh look, we got 2880. So I guess technically there was a boost bin or two because the boost bin's every 15 megahertz right now. So we were at 2850, so we've gained 30 megahertz so far. A temperature currently at 41, 42, technically 43 there. So we gotta let this run for a bit. We're gonna stuff our face because it's lunchtime and we're fat. And uh, we'll be back with what the max temps are. I'm really curious as to what the RAM is and I wish I could see the VRMs. Okay, so we've had the card running now for, shoot, uh, probably an hour. And uh, our temperature has equalized. The radiator definitely has some warmth going through it. Our current temperature is at 53, 52, 53. As you can see, our frequency is the same 2850 we were at. It dropped to 2865 from 2880 after it hit 43C. And then now at 2850 at in the low 50s, uh, 
temperature wise, clearly that means we have a pretty wide boost table there because 2850 is where we were when we hit 59 degrees when we were on air cooled. So, so far, for $129, which is what this costs, we have, and we're talking like full cover water block price range at this point. Anyway, um, we have now gained no clock frequency and dropped up to 8C, 7C to 8C, depending on the part of the test that we're talking about here. Now the VRMs, when I touch them, are freaking hot. They are very, very hot. And that's my concern with this. Now the fan has not sped up really. I mean, it's blowing air. It's just not blowing a lot. That's the thing that's concerning me. So if I use my FLIR, you can see where they are because they're glowing. I'll turn this light off so you guys can see a little better. But that glowing line right there, those are the VRMs. So you can see 71.3, 72 degrees. Now here's the thing. When I touch the back side of them, it's a lot of heat. That's exactly where the back plate was touching as well on the VRMs. So this back plate was helping with some heat dissipation. Obviously the VRMs were all touching here. Those are the chokes. The VRMs were also touching here. Um, it's funny, there's not a lot of material that takes it to the heat sink, but it still draws heat down to the heat sink. Anyway, let's take a look what our max temperatures were. So here's the test. As you can see, I had this running for a very long time. <laughs> There's where it was 2865, like I said. And then it dropped to 2850 right around there. Clearly it's equalized. The max it got was 54, but that's only gonna be for like a split second. But look, it's sitting between 50 and 53 on pretty much all of the tests right there. If we go and take a look at memory temperature, it came down about 4C on the memory, which makes sense because of the fact that the memory is touching the cold plate, which is being cooled by the water. At the end of the day, it does what it's supposed to do, which is it, convert, it converts any 4070 Ti to a water-cooled card. It's still a hybrid. I still firmly believe uh, a full cover water block would be a better solution because they touch the VRMs. It touches other key components on the card too, not just the VRMs, the memory and the core. It touches a lot of different components that are specific that generate heat that need to be uh, cooled. I don't appreciate that we have to get rid of the back plate because as you can see, the back plate was doing something and uh, the, the, the measure of what it was doing is probably not huge, but still something. It's still a feature that is now missing from this product that we had to remove it. So, I mean, aesthetically, it doesn't look quite as bad as I expected. It just doesn't look good. Phil and I were talking about this. It reminds us of those PCI Express slot coolers that you could stick in. PCI Express that was designed to pull air in from the back of your case and push air up on those blower style coolers. It was designed to do that. To me, it reminds me of like a cheap, like Zalman cooler type of deal for a CPU back in the day. If this was like 69 bucks, I'd be like, nice. No, honestly, if it was like 69, 70 bucks, something like that, I'd be like, okay, I could see it. For $129, the real issue is the competition at that price point. Now, if you're gonna shop in the you know, full cover water blocks, I mean, $199 for the bike ski full coverage, 4070 Ti, Asus Tough, which is that one. See, if we're dealing with a specific card, like an AIB card, then the block has to be specific for that card because of the layout. So that gets an edge advantage over the fact that it will work with any 4070 slash 4070 Ti. Um, that's expensive. I didn't expect bike ski to be that much. However, if we look at mod my mods, uh, Mod My Mods has the Alpha Cool Ice Block uh, Aurora 4070 Ti Tough Gaming with backplate for 152. So I mean, we're talking what 129, 152. So we're talking 23 dollars more, 23.50 more. I would absolutely pay 23 dollars more to have a full cover water block on that. I just I feel like this product is priced wrong. I really do. It it's doing something. It's just not doing 129 dollars worth of something as far as I'm concerned. They really wanted me to uh, at least try the block out, put some fluid through it, put it on a card and see how I feel. Um, it hasn't changed my feelings on the aesthetics and it hasn't changed my feelings on how I feel about hybrid cards in general. And this could be any brand hybrid card, I would say the same thing. I don't like hybrid cards. So leave the air cooler on, bump up your fan speed, make sure you have plenty of airflow going to your card or, um, go with a full cover water block. Those are like the only two options I personally recommend. All right, guys, thanks for watching. As always, we'll see you in the next one. And at least now I have a handy dandy block of 
testing equipment I can just leave together. I, you know, I want to do a video where I make a actual water cooling testing station that has quick disconnects and radiators I can plug in and unplug and all that. That requires time and energy and money. 